It's time. It is time. It is time. Come on in the room. It is time for Therapy Thursday. Are you guys excited? Are y'all ready for this? Are you excited? I've missed you all so much. And I do want to just thank everybody for all of the love uh, just that has been shown to my beautiful wife and I as we have welcomed our third and final child into the world, Josiah Zion Flowers. You just your comments, DMs, emails, all of it. We're just so thankful. And I'm glad to be back to serve you for this Therapy Thursday and also a brand new sermon series um, entitled Love Is launching on Sunday. We're going to talk about that on Sunday. It's not what you think. So um, I'm just so excited. You know how I like to do. Can we start like a love thread? Tag somebody up and down the chat. Let them know I see you. I am so proud of you. Even Memorial Day weekend approaching, you are being intentional with your healing, intentional with therapy. Just tag somebody. I'm proud of you. I see you showing up for healing and spiritual growth. Welcome. 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 I'm not going to be belong. I'm not going to be before you long. Um, but there has been something that has been beating on my heart that I want to share with you. I, I first want you to know here at our local church and our ministry, we we do both. <laughs> like like we do both. On Sunday, you're going to get that word that that rhema, that logo sound doctrine, uh, and on Thursday, we're giving you therapy. We give you therapy because on Sunday, by God's grace, I'm speaking to your destiny. But on Thursday, we're speaking to your history. And for many of us, what has happened to where it is hard for us to be able to discern the voice of God is because I can't hear the voice of God in forward instruction when I'm still wounded from former devastation. This this is this is what God burdened me with at the end of 2021 when he was like, okay, I need you to do therapy Thursday because a lot of my children, they cannot hear my forward instruction due to former devastation, due to trauma, due to pain. They can't love their neighbor as they love themselves because they don't love themselves. Help my children heal on the inside. And so I rendered God my yes and just what God has been doing with Therapy Thursday week after week is absolutely amazing. Um, so I, I want to get to work and I want to start by this particular statement. New seasons are going to require a new level of emotional intelligence, thinking, and maturity. Please hear me. Where God is about to take you, the rooms that you're about to be in, the opportunities that you're about to have, your new season is going to require a new level of emotional intelligence, maturity, and thinking. You need a different level of maturity in the palace than what you had in the pasture. Mm. You need a new level of thinking because poor emotional intelligence in the pasture might cost you sheep. But poor emotional intelligence and thinking in the palace will cost you favor. I need to say it one more time. Poor emotional intelligence and thinking in the pasture can cost you sheep. But poor emotional intelligence and thinking in the palace can cost you favor. Come here. Come here. Let me give you Bible. David was in the pasture anointed to be king while Israel still had a king. That's a whole word in itself. I don't have time to bother that. In the pasture, he is being trained for Goliath. That bear that was practice. That lion that you killed, that you defeated to take your sheep back, that was practice for Goliath. And if you study the life of King David, if you really just do an overall synopsis of King David's life, you will discover that you really don't hear about any great victories or great exploits after Bathsheba. <laughs> Study it. Study his life. You really don't hear about a lot of monumental victories 
in King David's life after Bathsheba. Because the level of thinking that you had in the pasture, like in, the, in one season of David's life, he was thinking about God. He was thinking about God getting glorified. And since he was thinking about God, he was allowed to use the sword of Goliath to chop off his head. But in the next season in the palace, when he wasn't thinking about God, but he was just thinking about Bathsheba, he was just thinking about what he wanted to do to her. When he wasn't thinking about God, the sword of consequence never left his house. Your new season is going to require a new level of emotional intelligence, thinking, and maturity. God does have a plan for your life. God does have a plan for my life. Please hear me. I'm simply suggesting that yes, God has a plan for your life, but it is possible for us to be thinking ourselves out of experiencing it. Yes, God does have an amazing plan for your life, but it is possible that we are thinking our way out of experiencing it. I want to help us on tonight. I want to help us on tonight because if you're like me, if, if, if you desire high emotional IQ, if you desire self-government so that you can exuberate one of the fruits of the spirit that we hear about in Galatians chapter five, self-control, you're going to have to understand these three simple truths. I'm giving you points already. You're going to have to understand these three simple truths. Number one, feelings aren't facts. Number two, your mind can lie to you. And number three, don't believe everything you think. <laughs> if you want to have high emotional IQ, give God the utmost glory in your life. If you want to have another level of thinking and self-government so that you can exuberate this fruit of the spirit that we hear about in Galatians 5 that goes by the name of self-control, you're going to have to understand these three simple things. Number one, feelings aren't always facts. Your mind can lie to you and don't believe everything you think. I'm going to go a little deeper. Many of us, if we honestly audit our life, we will identify that our thinking is one of the main roles in our suffering and joylessness. Talk Holy Spirit. If we honestly audit our lives, the role that we are playing in our own suffering and our own joylessness is the way we think. The way we think. And I want to uncover this drainage system of peace on tonight. I want to uncover what has been burglarizing our joy, what has been burglarizing our confidence, what has been causing for us to have a high volume of insecurity, and that is the way we think. The way we think. We have to talk about this because ignorance leads to suffering and suffering leads to suffocation. Ignorance leads to suffering and suffering leads to suffocation. What is being suffocated due to the way we think is our faith. What is being suffocated due to the way we think is our devotion. What is being suffocated due to the way we think is even our obedience. It's the drainage system of our peace. The way we think, the way we think, the way we think, our thoughts, our mind, the way we think, our thoughts, our mind. I remember... I remember back in 2018, if anybody's been watching any Therapy Thursday for a while or the ministry for a while, you'll keep on hearing me talk about 2018. It was just, it was a, it was a rough year. It was a rough year. It was my like wilderness year, Judas year. It's like a lot of people turning on me. I'm like, please, one at a time. It was just a whole lot. Some of it was my own choices, but I remember walking around in 2018, just angry. I was easily angered and I just felt upset constantly and I really couldn't always trace it to an event. I was angry before the betrayal. I was angry before stuff was happening. Like the things that were happening, I finally was like, okay, this is why I just felt my spirit is about to happen. But 
I would find myself walking around angry. And I just remember praying, God, why? Why am why is the first emotion I feel when I wake up? Anger. And God gave me this revelation that's going to be prophetic for somebody. Many times, the unexplainable anger that you feel is the Holy Spirit grieving. We are mislabeling many times the grieving of the Holy Spirit as anger. How many more times are you going to keep on rehearsing their lies over my truth? You are allowing lies of the culture to veto what I said about you. Oh, I'm talking to somebody who keeps on walking around angry. Sometimes the anger that you feel is the spirit of the living God on the inside of you grieving because you keep on meditating on falsehood. You keep on meditating on what they think versus meditating on the word of God. Why is this important? Because when we are prey to our own emotions and thinking, we limit our obedience. Did y'all hear what I just said? When we keep falling prey to our emotions and our thinking, we will limit our obedience. These three things that I'm going to keep on articulating throughout our session on tonight. Maybe the reason we keep on suffering in our head is due to us not understanding that feelings aren't facts. Your mind can lie to you. And number three, you're believing everything you think. God, in this moment, would you help us to cast down ungodly thoughts? Help us to stop seeing ourselves through the trauma. Stop seeing ourselves through the failure. Stop seeing ourselves through the insecurity. But God, would you help us to be able to have a Christocentric perspective, a Christ-centered perspective of who we are. We're asking that you do it and allow for this session to be a guidance, a navigation system on how we could begin our journey, on how we could begin our journey to see ourselves correctly and think good thoughts about us. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Can I get everybody to put in the room a man? A man. We're going to we're going to tackle and speak around this thought for just a few moments on this beautiful Therapy Thursday, don't believe everything you think. Don't believe everything you think. I want us to put this confession in the room in all caps. Can I get all of us to put this in the room in all caps? Father, give me the mental strength. Give me the mental strength to cast down every imagination that contradicts your thoughts about me. One more time. Father, give me the mental strength to cast down every imagination that contradicts your thoughts about me. Don't believe everything you think. 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 Why? Because I tried to get us to understand this back in January. Some thoughts aren't yours. They are a Satan-induced ponder. Some thoughts aren't yours. So therefore, if you believe everything you think, you are setting yourself up to believe falsehood. You're setting yourself up to believe what the enemy is lying to you about. It's going to be hard for you to accept the truth when you can't identify what lie is holding you hostage. Don't believe everything you think. Don't believe everything you think. Don't believe everything you think. Some thoughts aren't yours. What do we see in scripture? The first time we see that old serpent at work, he is telling Eve, you won't surely die. For God knows if you eat this fruit, you will be like him, knowing the good and the evil. The first setup of temptation. What do we see the enemy doing? He is trying to get Eve to entertain a thought. <laughs> the first time in the text, in Genesis, we see the enemy trying to get in her head. 
The battlefield is in the mind and he is striving to get in your head because it is possible that we are thinking our way out of due season. Mm. It is possible that we are thinking our way out of spiritual promotion. It is possible that we are thinking our way out of obedience. Because when we are prey to our own emotions and our own thinking, we limit our obedience. I want to give you several passages of scripture where you can see I'm not up here just giving you my philosophy or my opinion. I want to show you in the text, how many times the way people in scripture are thinking is manifesting into how they're feeling. Let me give you Bible. Let me give you Bible. Okay. Exodus chapter four, verse 10. This is after God came to Moses and said, okay, go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Look at, look at Moses response. Verse 10, Exodus chapter four, verse 10, Moses says to the Lord, Pardon your servant, Lord, I have I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. Then the Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouth? Who makes the deaf or the mute? Who gives sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. Verse 13. But Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. (laughs) He's like, look, I have an assignment for you, Moses. The people, my people have been crying out to me. I need you to go represent me. How Moses is thinking is manifesting into how he's feeling. I'm of slow speech, meaning he had a stutter or a lisp, or an issue with being able to communicate what he deemed as effective. But God was not looking for his ability. He was looking for his availability. Right here, we are seeing that his thinking is giving him a feeling. Because when we are prey to our own emotions and thinking, we limit our obedience. More Bible, Jonah chapter 1. You know, my boy, Jonah chapter one, verse one, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of a Mittai, go to that great city of Nineveh and preach against it because this wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port after paying the fare. I really could really mess with that. He went down after paying the fare. Anytime you run from God, you're going to find something in your life going down and you're going to pay for it. I don't have time to bother that. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Jonah's like, I don't like the Assyrians. They've been bullish to my people and I think they deserve judgment. So if you are going to come down, if you're going to exercise judgment against them, bet. <laughs> It's about time, Yahweh. I'm like, I'm I'm not going to help with them getting right. I'm not going to position them to receive your grace. I'm out. Notice how he thinks manifest into how he feels. If you read the whole book of Jonah, you'll see that Jonah then got angry with God because of his grace towards Nineveh. The way that he was thinking manifest into his feeling which was anger give you more bible joshua chapter 6 verse 16 i want y'all to see this because i'm telling you when we fall prey to our emotions and our thinking it will limit our obedience and i'm giving you passage after passage where people were about to have limited obedience because of how they thought or because of how they felt joshua chapter 6 verse 16 it says The seventh time around, this is the battle of Jericho when they were victorious. The seventh time around, as the priests sounded the long blast on their horns, Joshua commanded the people, shout, for the Lord has given you the town. Jericho and everything in it must be completely destroyed. Somebody put in the room completely, not incrementally, completely. Mental bookmark that. Okay. 
it must be completely destroyed as an offering to the Lord. Only Rahab, the prostitute, and the others in her house will be spared, for she protected our spies. Do not take any of the things set apart for destruction, or you yourselves will, there's that word again, be completely destroyed, and you will bring trouble on the camp of Israel. Everything made from silver, gold, bronze, or iron is sacred to the Lord and must be brought into his treasury. So the Lord is saying, okay, you're going to have the victory. I just have some instructions for you to follow. So later on, Joshua and his men see the town of Ai, and they're about to take over Ai. They go to battle with Ai, and they're getting their butts whooped. Joshua's like, man, what's going on? You told me you were going to be with me like you were with Moses. Why do we lose? Why are we losing this? And God tells Joshua, get up off of your face. Israel has sinned. So Joshua then goes up to Achan and is like, yo, don't lie to me. Tell me what you have done. We're losing fights. Revelation just came to me. We are losing fights that we should be winning because our obedience is limited. What are you losing because you have a limited obedience due to the way you think and feel? If your feelings are the highest determining factor to whether you will obey God or not, you will find yourself losing battles that you have oil to win. So Aiken, what's, what's up? Don't lie to me. What's going on, bro? So in Joshua chapter 7, verse 20, we see Aiken responding to Joshua. Aiken replied, it is true. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. Among the plunder, I saw a beautiful robe from Babylon, 200 silver coins, and a bar of gold weighing more than a pound. I wanted them so much that I took them. I wanted him so much that I slept with him. I wanted her so much that I slept with her. I wanted this so much that I lied on my taxes. I, okay, y'all get the point. I wanted them so much that I took them. They are hidden in the ground beneath my tent with the silver buried deeper than the rest. When we keep falling prey to our emotions and our thinking, we will have limited obedience. It's possible. It is possible for our mind to be so crowded with fear, our mind to be so crowded with insecurities, our mind to be so crowded with bitterness, our mind to be so crowded with trauma that a word from God has to stand in the long line of our overthinking. Don't believe everything you think. 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 Listen, the genesis of emotional intelligence and high kingdom thinking is when we recognize that our reactions are not always due to our inability to govern them, but rather that they are a child of a thought. Did y'all hear what I just said? One more time. The genesis of emotional intelligence and high kingdom thinking is when we recognize that our reactions are not always due to the inability to govern them, but rather that they are a child of a thought because thoughts our parents and feelings are the children. This is so good. Thoughts are the parents and our feelings are the children. I feel angry. What are you thinking? I feel horny. What are you thinking? I feel bitter. What are you thinking? Thoughts are the parents of feelings. Like our feelings aren't always due to an external event. Many times they're due to how we're thinking about the event. Mm. This is how two people can come outside of their job. It is storming. They both have nice transportation and one individual will say, oh no, my hair is gonna get wet. I'm gonna be stuck in traffic. And the other individual is gonna say, thank God for the rain. I don't have to water my garden today. Both had the same job, both in the same city, both in the same place, both have nice transportation but it's just they're thinking differently over the same thing. 
I am not, please hear me, please hear me and hear my heart. I am not minimizing the events that you have gone through. I'm simply suggesting, could it be your thoughts are maximizing them? The reason my healing is taking so long is not just the event, but it's my ability to reframe and renew my thinking about it. Bible all day. Jesus is getting beat. He is being spit upon. He is being nailed to a cross. And his thinking is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, if it was me, I, I'm like, sonic boom, take your oxygen, heart attack. This is what I'm thinking. You hurting me? I'm the son of God. You hurt me? I'm going to hurt you too. But Jesus' thought was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The genesis of emotional intelligence and high kingdom thinking is when we understand that our reactions are not due to our inability to govern them, but rather that they are the child of our thoughts. What we feel is the offspring of how we are thinking. Therefore, it is possible for you to think wrong about a season or a person which will manifest in inaccurate feelings towards the season or the person. Because feelings aren't always facts. Don't believe everything you think because the mind can lie to you. The mind can lie to you. And how, how I believe this starts is really two things. Two things. Number one, I call this go to your room conditioning. This is how I believe it starts to where we allow our mind to torment us to such a degree to where we are plagued by insomnia and joylessness. It's go to your room conditioning. It's like when you were young in childhood and you, you, you weren't able to, to express yourself or be able to talk it out, but you're just told, go to your room. This is why this video I did two years ago about my son, I was um, sharing that when he was mad, I asked him, what was he mad about? And he said, I'm mad at you. And I said, why are you mad at me? You didn't let me go out here. Well, why does that make you upset? People were actually ridiculing me and saying, you raising a soft son. <laughs> we don't have time for all of that questions. We, I told you to do something, just obey. And if that's how you wanna raise your child, that's on you. But for me, I feel it's an obligation I feel as though God has given me an obligation to not raise up any more men that do not know how to articulate what they feel. They don't know how to, I want to be able to have sons that naturally have feelings, but then will think, is this feeling accurate? What we don't need any more of is men who have feelings and don't think first. That's how we end up in prison. That's how we end up in cemeteries because we have feelings and emotions. We don't know what to do with them. We were never given a time in our life where somebody gave us wisdom to trace why you're feeling the way you're feeling. And is it accurate? I'm just angry, I shoot you. I'm just angry, I hurt you. I'm just angry. I wanna be able to have sons that experience emotions and can think and possibly trace why they're having that emotion. So I was asking him, okay, why are you upset at me? You didn't let me go over here, okay? Now, let me explain to you. I didn't let you go over there because I can't see you. Cars could come, you could possibly get hit by a car. So I placed these boundaries here to protect you. You see, I want you to understand so that as you're having these thoughts, it could be tied to some intelligence. It's not that daddy doesn't love me. It's that daddy loves me so much he's telling me no. When do we hear that preached? <laughs> we hear more about he's the God of yes to where we don't know how to handle when he's the God that says no to. When he's the God that allows you to go in the fiery furnace. He's the God that allows you to be thrown in the lion's den. We don't know how to handle that part because we keep on preaching he's the God of yes. Go to your room conditioning. When you are a child and you're constantly told to go to your room, shut up, be quiet, stay in a child's place, you're sitting in your room with all of these thoughts and you have been classically conditioned how to work through on your own in your head. No wisdom, no guidance, no discipleship. You were raised and cultivated in an atmosphere where you deal with your thoughts alone. You deal with your, this is how suicidal thoughts happen. This is how fits of rage have been conjured up. 
because the mouth is the ventilation system of the heart. And when I do not have an opportunity to understand and do not have an opportunity to vent, it's clogging my heart. So we were forced to deal with our own thoughts. Many of us have been forced on how to survive. We've been forced in atmospheres that were unhealthy. Some of that was our upbringing and our household. We've been hurt and deceived by fake friends. Like I said many times, that pain hits different when it comes from somebody you told all your pain to and they said they would never hurt you but they do it with a remix. That pain hits different. You're tired of being the bigger person. And I just wanna give you this simple thought. Um, if you constantly have to be the bigger person, could it be your circle's too small? Like you're the only one that can be held accountable. You're the only one that can be corrected. Better yet, think of this. Out of all of your friends, how often have they corrected you and how well can they receive your correction? Because you could always see the foundation of a friendship after a disagreement. But I don't understand why would they do me like that? I would never do them like that. Okay, I need you to understand. You cannot hold somebody accountable to your level of maturity. This is so good, y'all. You cannot hold somebody accountable to your level of maturity. Go to your room, conditioning. And then number two, how did this overthinking happen? Perfectionism. Are there any perfectionists watching tonight? <laughs> Perfectionism. See, one of the issues of being a perfectionist is the training of God will feel like punishment because perfectionists are blinded to progression. It will feel like punishment when you're in a wilderness season because perfectionists are blinded to progression. They're blinded to progression, to progression, and they'll keep on comparing their chapter three to somebody's chapter 23. So you're telling me as a perfectionist, you're insecure because you keep comparing yourself to somebody who has to use four apps before they post the picture? <laughs> Perfectionism. Perfectionists can get so caught up in what they don't have that they can't celebrate what no longer has them. I, I believe we have perfectionist, the exit strategist, the demonologist, and the mentally intelligent, okay? Perfectionists, they so, they're so caught up in what they don't have that they can't celebrate what no longer has them. The exit strategists, these are people who just wanna see a way out. How do I get out? They'll go ghost on you fast because they haven't understood it is better for me to embrace the discomfort of evolution than for me to stand in the graveyard of familiarity. Extra strategies. I, I just want to get out. I just want to get out. If I do this, then I'll get out. If I do this, then God will get me out. And so they're frustrated with seasons where God is trying to train them because they're always trying to find a way out versus trying to find what God is trying to get out. And maybe it's our thinking because we're thinking our way out of obedience. The demonologist is where everything's a devil. Everything, it's raining, all the devil. <laughs> Negative, it's raining, all the devil. Somebody criticizes you in the comment section, look at the devil. Just everything is the devil. The stream's glitching, look at the devil. Everything is the devil. And so, and so sometimes we try to blame the devil for accountability that we should be giving ourselves due to the way we're thinking. Because remember, parents are thoughts and the children are feelings. The mentally intelligent, these are people who embrace wisdom because they recognize that wisdom provides you with multiple choice. When I don't have this type of wisdom and these type of atmospheres where I can get therapy for free and I'm getting healing, when I don't have these type of spaces, I could only circle C. I'm turning up. That's all I got. I'm cursing you out. That's all I got. C. That's all I got. But wisdom gives you multiple choice. It reminds you that you have the power on how you're going to respond. Yeah, they irritated me. Wisdom says, okay... The emotional intelligent thing to do is for me to recognize that I could choose where I pay attention. I am not forced to pay attention to everything. I have the choice to choose where I pay attention. And so this is something that I was thinking about. Uh, I want you to try this. L let's try like an actual mental exercise together. Think about a time in your life where you were happy. 
Think about a time in your life when you were having a great time. You were enjoying yourself. Now, what comes to me is there was this time I was a student pastor and we all went to Six Flags. This is just the event that I chose to, to share with you for this illustration. We were having water balloon fights, uh, funnel cakes, riding roller coasters, great time. I want you to think, right now, we're doing this. This is therapy, right now. I want you to think about a time in your life. God, I hope somebody hasn't been drowned under so much trauma that this is difficult. Think of a time in your life where you were having a great time. You were really, really enjoying yourself. Think about it. I'll wait. <laughs> Think about it. Okay. That time when you were having a great time, you were happy, you were laughing. Okay. Now, I want you to think about what were you thinking about while you were having a great time? What were you thinking about while you were having a great time? You know what you'll find out? For many of us, we weren't really thinking about anything. <laughs> ah, freedom, Lord. When I was with my whole youth ministry, riding roller coasters, eating funnel cakes, having water balloon fights, going down water slides, I really wasn't thinking about anything. On the flip side of that, the times in my life where I'm the most stressed, high anxiety, overwhelmed, burnt, I'm thinking the most. <laughs> the time when I was having a great time, I was thinking little. This is so good. But the time where I wasn't having a great time, I was thinking a whole lot. What if truly our greatest suffering is due to us thinking too much? And that is just that like that is just a small experiment to show you the times you were having a great time, your thought process wasn't extremely active. Now I know somebody may be like, no, this happened to me, but for the most part, when you're having a great time or having fun, I'm really not overwhelmed in my head. But the times when I'm really stressed out, my mind is gone. Phew! Just thought after thought, thought after thought, thought after thought. Think about the time when you couldn't sleep at night. And now I want you to think about your mind. Thought after thought, thought after thought, thought after thought. Because thoughts are parents and our feelings are the children and on the flip side of that there may be individuals like you know I don't feel nothing okay thoughts are parents feelings are the children I don't feel anything and this this happened to me one time when I was having this conversation it was this counseling session with a brother and he was just like yeah I don't know what it is uh pastor Jay I just I don't feel nothing and in that moment I really believe the Holy Spirit gave me this revelation and that is depression does not always come as sadness. Sometimes it comes as numbness. Depression doesn't always show itself by sadness. Sometimes it shows itself by numbness. I don't want to eat. I don't want to go. I don't want to go over there. I'm good. Depression is almost attacking us undercover because we've always married depression to sadness, but sometimes it's truly numbness. No empathy, no sympathy, no passion, numbness. So how do we overcome this? Remember I told us I can't stand preaching, teaching, sermon sessions that don't give us how-to takeaways, okay? I just gave you one by, by asking you, think about a time when you were having a great time so that you can see most of the time when we're stressed the most, we're thinking the most, okay? But how do I overcome this? If I wanna to get to the place where I'm like, okay, don't believe everything I think. All right, number one, interrogate the thought. Before you allow that, that thought to give birth to a feeling, I feel like this, wait, before we do that, interrogate 
the thought. Familiar passage of scripture that I shared with us before, but I want to break it down in a different way. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, praiseworthy, meditate. Think on. Dwell. Think on these things. So how do I interrogate my thought? Okay. Is this true? Is this noble? Is this just? Is this pure? Is this lovely? Is this a good report? Is this virtue? I'm literally seeing, does this thought line up with what God told me to meditate on? Before I meditate on it, not saying that, not saying that things don't happen, but before I dwell, inhabit the mind there, let me first interrogate to see if it's just, if it's loving, if it's noble, if it's a good report. That doesn't mean what happens is going to go away, but it just means I'm not going to meditate on the thought because I'm told to meditate on these thoughts. Interrogate the thought. Interrogate the thought. Point number two, take captive the thought and demolish the fortress. Take captive the thought and demolish the fortress. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse five, casting down arguments. Some of us argue in our head, casting down arguments and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought captive into, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Okay, I'm taking every thought taking every thought captive. This is going to take work. This is going to take work. Take the thought captive. And the reason I added and demolish the fortress is because the only way an army can take those people captive is they have to first defeat the town. They have to first defeat the fortress. Once I've defeated the fortress, then I could take it captive. So if your fortress is Instagram, that is what is constantly causing for you to think on thoughts that are unhealthy. And that is what constantly keeps on making you overthink thoughts and comparing yourself. I might need to demolish, which in our terms, deactivate it for a while so that I could take captive every thought that keeps on trying to exalt itself against the word of God. Where are the thoughts coming from? Take every thought captive. Number three, exchange the thought. Exchange the thought. Because after I'm at a place where like, I'm going to interrogate the thought, I'm going to take captive the thought, I have to exchange it. Because if I don't, it's just, it's just sitting there. And this is the method of God. He removes it and replaces it or removes it and becomes it. Sin had a hold on us. God didn't like that. He wanted to remove it and replace it. So he became it. He who knew no sin became sin for us. I want to remove it, so I became it. So once I remove that thought, how about place that thought with devotion? Exchange the thought. Instead of me meditating on this, I'm going to exchange it with devotion. I'm going to exchange it with a workout plan. I'm going to exchange it with an, audio, with an audible book. I need to exchange the thought. And after you exchange the thought, last point, number four, remember his thoughts toward us. Remember his thoughts toward us. Remember his thought towards us. I really want, if you haven't yet, you to go back and check out the therapy Thursday session. Your mind is too crowded because one of the number one questions that we keep on getting still to this day is how do I get control over my thought process? And I wanted to come on here for a few, mo few moments on tonight and challenge us. Don't believe everything you think. Because feelings aren't always facts. Feelings are wonderful servants, terrible masters. And your mind can lie to you. The same way the enemy caused for there to be a thought in Eve's mind that was lying to her. Because the enemy strives to kill, steal, and destroy. But he doesn't need to steal, kill, or destroy anything from our life if our thoughts are already doing that. God, would you help us? Would you help us to renew our mind? Be ye transformed by the renewing of our mind. 
transformation happens here in our mind by the power of the Holy Spirit saving our life covering us with your blood now we have to do the work of renewing our mind help us to renew our mind so that we're not falling prey to our emotions and our thinking we desire to glorify you give us the wisdom to do it in Jesus name we pray Amen.